hopefully you can see this. I uh, scream out if not. So I uh, I think it was a great to have that. It's almost like a setup for what I want to talk about, Vicky. So I'm very happy about that. So I'm coming into this from uh, the area of reproducibility. Now we know there's lots of other areas in science that also is difficult with the reproducibility, but we're thinking particularly about computational reproducibility here. Because you would think, like you're, you're just explaining, you've got it all the computer, it should be possible to just run it again, right? But that's not how it's reported today. So this is a, a really brilliant paper, I would say, in uh, metagenomics, which is, has a massive method section. If you just highlight out here, you see it, these are all the tools that it's using, right? You have version numbers, parameters, data sources, and so on. Kind of the details are there superficially at least but for me to do run the same you know it take me a few weeks to build up again that workflow right just to see if this is something i want to do and they have moved down the pyramids right so they have provided the code so you have those things there but now all those details are gone right the version numbers all those those uh, things that the machine could process and find out more about they're all gone right so there's no fair aspect anymore about uh, the software here. So how do I get about getting this to work with all the things it needs? So we heard about workflows from Carol, and I guess I don't want to convince you again, you should should try using workflow systems. Uh, and particularly, I'm interested here in the abstraction that you get from the workflow system. Right? So that you, it's not just this tangled mess we heard about, but you can actually almost like get a diagram out of it from any of the system. But that is the problem. There's quite a few workflow systems. So we'll be keeping a list on the wiki. Please go and add your favorite if they're not there. So we have 300 last time I checked. And so how do you choose which one? And how do you make sure your computational analysis, your method, actually works across this uh, workflow system? Because why, if you tied into one of them, now you're locked into lots of different things. So that's the motivation we had when we made the common workflow language. So we found that lots of these, all what they really do before they go special is just to call some command line tools. One of my colleagues just said, it's just a make file, isn't it? Yes, it's make file on steroids, right? All of these are really just chaining together command line tools, part with parallelization, container images and so on. Now common workflow language have that as the base point. And you see all of the here you have multiple engines connecting and growing list of people who are adapting it. And the way, and here is uh, uh, a nature interview with the same authors of the paper we saw before, where he's talking about how now by moving to common workflow language, he was actually able to collaborate with basically his competitor because they had lots of things in common, even though they were doing the analysis in different ways. Most notably, they could share the way they call the tools together, right? So they could collaborate on the boring bits of the workflow while they could focus on the science. So basically, this is basically a very small example of how that would work, right? Because you have the main uh, common workflow language file on here. So it is a language, it's a file you can type in uh, uh, your inputs and outputs and then a series of steps. But then each step is a file that is separated out. And that's how you kind of wrap a tool you want to run. So that is the main uh, reason why you could reuse them again in many different workflows. And then of course, in there, you would have again, inputs and outputs to that particular tool or more precisely that usage of a tool, right? Because a command line could be doing many different things depending on the options and so on. So that's where you tie in how to actually run it, right? But we need to actually have something to run. So it could just be, oh, we assume it's already installed, but that's not good enough. You should, you can provide Docker images and so on that then are downloaded directly. And you could, there's actually a list as you can have multiple fallbacks in case uh, you're running, for instance, on HPC and you cannot use Docker containers. In case you haven't heard about containers, it's basically a way to wrap a kind of mini operating system with all the things you need to run one particular tool. That's the kind of philosophy. That means each of the step can have different environments for how you run. That's common across many workflow systems now, which is helping a lot on reproducibility and more importantly, reusability. Now let's uh, have a look about research objects. And so now when we introduced this concept of research object, you see back then in 2011, that was a main ingredient of that was to say, well, you should use workflows to tie together the software you're using to, to analyze and run your data. But you need the other things you need yeah, you need the actual data reference in there, 
and then you have the results coming out, and then you tie these things together, then now you're starting to approach something that is more uh, accessible and more complete than this old PDF that you have to read, because now the computer can also access it. Now, the latest instance of the research object concept is something we call RO crate. So have we kind of gone a bit back to basics because we were kind of lost in the semantic web land for it. But now we kind of try to make it a bit more concrete for the base use case. So this is uh, uh, my co-chair Peter Sefton in Australia who ha have presented this as the, uh, from what we now see as the, the kind of starting point for packaging some data. You just have some files on the disk. You should be able to just describe them with some, uh, Good piece of metadata and put them in the context and describe how they came to be and that is by adding the our create metadata document now in there you can not just add all your data files and so on you can also add in things in the world that could be reference data sets and so on things you download because it'd be instruments it could be places you've been to it could be uh, people it could be organizations and so on as long as you have some kind of identifier or at least you can describe it in it goes, and that is completing the contextual picture of the research object. And then here is uh, Peter's very simple example, because we, we should be able to handle a base example, right? Which is, we just get some rubbish file names coming out of our camera. This could be an electron microscope or anything like that as well. We have much worse file names. And you want to give it a bit more description. So here we're just giving it a name. So that's, you have a little JSON file for that. But then you can push a button and you also get an HTML rendering for that. Why, why do we emphasize that? Well, we don't want to tie yourself to particular infrastructures and platforms and so on. So when you store your research data, you should also be able to have a human readable version of that accessible. So the HTML file is actually stored with the data and the metadata. And then you can add some provenance to connect all these things together. And that's just what I'm going to talk a bit more about in a, in a second. Now, I can go into the ticket deep dive, but we don't really have time for that. But based, needless to say that we have made a specification that says how you use something called schema.org for connecting up the different things you want to describe. So basically, we're using existing technologies like JSON-LD, which is a way to make link data uh, in fairly simple data structures, and uh, a vocabulary called schema.org, which many web developers will recognize because that is what used to give markup on your website so that Google can give you these little info boxes and so on. But it's also quite powerful for these kind of things because most of the kind of things in the world already exist in there. But you can specialize it like we have done with bioschemas for uh, the bio domain. So here's basically a shortcut of how it works. We have these identifiers that link the different blocks together. Now, most people, they don't want to see that, right? They want to, to just click a button and get on with their life, right? So we, we want to show a bit of the different kind of tools we have. The basic tool is one catering for that use case of having just a bunch of files. So here you can click and describe individual files and you can add in the different contextual descriptions and so on, and it will make that metadata for you. And then again, the rendering here. So here you see the, that kind of rendering where you can navigate into the different things, even though it's just a single file. So that's my argument that FAIR is not just machine readable. Keep the human in the loop, right? So don't make it too uh, inaccessible. Now, so one, I want to link back to the first session where we heard about cultural heritage, and that's also been another use case. So here, our crate is actually underneath the hood. So this is a, a project called Paradisic in the Pacific and Australian region, which is capturing People speaking the native languages that are at risk of extinction, not the people, but the languages. And there's all these recordings in the wild, and you see some of them are very old and handwritten and so on, but they have been digitized and put together and put on a website so you can access them and then put in the repositories. And this is all rendered with all this metadata in here, so you can filter and search for that. But this is all coming from our credit, which you cannot see unless you push the magic button. Right. I want to point out here that when we talk about fair, it does actually say that it is permittable that you cannot access, that you need to request access to the data. And that's the case here, because this is human subjects, you need to follow a set of 
regulations before you allowed access to the data. Right, so here it's very nice to have the distinction between the metadata and the actual data, like the recordings in this case. That comes into licensing and so on. Yeah, you've so, got one minute. Uh, sorry, two minutes. Okay, so I want to show you a bit more about uh, how we do things in workflows. So Carol showed you a bit about workflow hub and so on, and where we use our create to capture uh, the data about the workflows. Uh, you can also do that for capturing the run, which we saw. I will show you this massive list of things you could capture. The repository could help you with that. And I want to show you a bit more about the tools because the basic case is you just use a tool and then you want to describe it. But it could be uh, that you have a very complicated case like we have here. This is the building blocks we have in BioXL. So we have taken research software and wrapped them in all the different ways. So they're very bit messy, like we heard Colin talking about before, and then we patch them up, and then you can use them in a different workflow system. But that means that now a workflow is actually, is already turned into this kind of uh, box of a box of a box, right? Because we, if we now go into our create and look at the workflow, here we have these different building blocks being used. So here's one, and then, here you can add for that particular building block all the different references size. So here you see the build, the, the containers, the Python, and so on. And then you can go in there again and say, which software start use? And that might have a different set of citations and so on. And that's basically where is the power of the R create in that you can dig in where you need to. And the, in the case of people who haven't already provided uh, code meta and that kind of useful thing, you can still provide that metadata on their behalf. So that's it. You can read a lot more about that in our paper, which I have linked in there. And I want to thank the ever-growing community of our great uh, people.